Good day to all of you. Thank you for being with us here on this panel for our joint celebration of the World Biodiversity Day of the 22nd of May. The theme of this year is our solutions are to be found in nature. And this uh, World Day is, of course, taking place in the course of a year that is particularly difficult for all of us. We find ourselves with this pandemic in extraordinary difficulties. And uh, scientists have, in fact, established a pretty clear link between the propagation of this uh, infectious disease and uh, human activities that destroy biodiversity. And so with the four of you, we'd like to talk today about uh, our shared values, about what uh, links us up uh, together. Values have been mentioned in other panels as being crucial at this particular time. So I would like to have a discussion with you at UNESCO on these values, what uh, connects us, what links us together in these very difficult and uncertain times. So thank you for being with us. And I'd like to give the floor to Alain Ballade, who is uh, the uh, Director of Development, of Social Development of the LVMH. who We're very pleased to have LVMH uh, as a UNESCO partner on the issue of biodiversity. So my first uh, question, as responsible for environmental development, ecological development in your group, can you share some thoughts with us uh, about this crisis that we're experiencing? Well, I'll do that with great pleasure. As you said, this uh, crisis is unprecedented. It's uh, completely new, completely extraordinary. It affects everyone, whatever the social class or category. It affects all continents, all countries, so that means that it has a scope that is incommensurable compared to previous uh, crises of the same kind. And one of the first tasks of the group for which I work was to try immediately to try to envisage what solutions could be proposed in order to try to resolve certain problems. Knowing what's at stake, how significant this is. I mean, not everyone has disinfecting gel or masks and so on. And so the companies of the group as a whole immediately started to think about how they could contribute, convert our production sites uh, in order to assist. So we, in fact, ended up uh, producing disinfecting gel in our cosmetics laboratories. And in France, but also in the United States, we converted our uh, seamstress workshops into mask production workshops. Now, of course, uh, that's a small contribution. So much uh, uh, needs uh, to be done. Um, and we tried other things as well. For instance, uh, Moet NC uh, has uh, a lot of vineyards in France. And we tried to use, we succeeded, in fact, in using the lodging for employees uh, as special lodging for healthcare workers. Uh, and, and we believe that that. Uh, is in line with the very important value today of solidarity and of societal usefulness, of social contribution. Uh, I'm uh, saying this also as the chairperson of a French association for corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility has become extremely important in this crisis, and that's something that we must preserve in order to be socially useful in the future. Well, what's at stake now for LVMH? We want to reopen our production workshops, our shops, our boutiques, uh, but in doing so, we are governed by one obsession, which is the health of our employees and of our clients. And the way in which we work has to be uh, absolutely irreproachable when it comes to hygiene. We have to be irreproachable in the uh, health conditions that we offer to our clients as well. And many of the values that um, 
LVMH holds dear in any event have become important. We have a program for some, we had it for some years called Life 2020. It's going to be transformed into Life 2030. And the overall objective is to break this vicious circle between climate warming, the impact that we're having on natural resources, on biodiversity, and all of this, of course, associated with the appearance of new pandemics. Uh, climate uh, warming could result in the COVID-19 of tomorrow, further COVIDs uh, down the road. And that is something that we must absolutely avoid. So that is our main objective. That's what's at stake. And we do believe that we can transform this crisis into an opportunity and convince everyone that the health of the planet really means the health of human beings. And the flagrant and dramatic uh, events that have occurred, obviously the result of human action uh, must be uh, changed. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Helene, for those uh, first comments and for making that statement about the link between the pandemic and human activity and also the importance of the relationship between man and nature. Raphael Madveu, as a researcher at the CNRS, you work on this link between human beings and nature, and perhaps you could react to what Hélène has said and maybe share with us your view of the changes that seem now to be necessary because of this extraordinary and absolutely unique crisis that we're experiencing. Well, yes, thank you very much. Indeed, that's a very broad-ranging question that you're putting to me. It's being debated in many different fora at the present time and is resulting also in some concrete action. I might perhaps start by reminding you of a basic elementary principle, namely that the human being is connected to other living beings, that our identity is first and foremost an ecological identity. We are first and foremost part of nature. And uh, so we have to think of the air we breathe, of the food we eat, of the bacteria that help us to digest, of the landscapes that make us say, wow, because they're so beautiful. Now, in changing the climate, the water, the land, we are becoming direct or indirect managers of nature. And since we depend on more and more factors which depend more and more on us, we are in a position to change certain things and to give meaning to our action. Our societies, I believe, do have the possibility, more so than ever before, to take into consideration the consequences of their choices, of their actions, on the interdependencies among the various uh, components of the living world. Uh, so this uh, one can choose uh, uh, in favor of ecological solidarity, as one chooses economic solidarity vis-a-vis -vis disadvantaged groups of the population. Uh, but ecological solidarity is uh, what's at stake here. We need to transform our living spaces into spaces that are capable of um, thinking and acting in a way that is fully in line with those principles of ecological solidarity. So ultimately, the ecological transition that has become our challenge uh, today obliges us to rethink our relationship with the living world. And many philosophers have uh, dwelt on this issue in recent times. But we also need to think of uh, our interrelationship with that uh, tremendous power that we have to organize the living world. And the will to change society isn't uh, sufficient. There must be a genuine action. It must become operational in the field. And I think it's of fundamental importance to raise 
awareness about the diversity of interdependencies and to try to open up new areas of action and to try democratically to mobilize the citizens to develop ways of living that are less dependent on fossil fuels without, of course, uh, uh, imposing all of the cost on the most vulnerable and those uh, furthest removed from our modern way of life. And we need to also leave a lot of space for relations that have been forgotten in recent years, cultural, ethic relations, the way that we interact with the living world must become more culturally ethic or ethically cultural. So those are the sorts of things that need to be implemented. Uh, and some of which uh, are already in progress uh, at a local level, at least. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael, for sharing those thoughts with us. Obviously, there's much at stake here and many changes to be introduced. I'd now like to turn to Alice Roth uh, to, for a reaction to what's been said by Hélène and Raphael about values and also about this uh, transformation, this period of uncertainty of transition that we find ourselves in. And some people are saying that we're between an old world and a new world. We don't yet know how to define the new world. Now, you work uh, in the MAB France team. You set up an association of young people with a view to being active forces in this ongoing process of change. Could you perhaps uh, share with us your views, your impressions, and tell us uh, what you uh, see to be the strong points, what, what uh, advantages do we have to get us through this difficult period? Well, thank you very much. Uh, Raphael has talked about ecological solidarity. I believe that to be a key value as well that will help us uh, to get through this difficult, these difficult times. Uh, but I would like to speak more particularly about intergenerational solidarity, because here in France, many other places in the world, for two months, uh, all of the inhabitants of the country have uh, confined themselves to their home. They've locked down, uh, and they have avoided contact with others. Uh, this with a view to protecting mainly the older people, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, but we, young adults, uh, uh, have uh, a... Um, uh, a value or an obligation of solidarity, even if the virus did not uh, directly threaten us, uh, we needed to do this in order to protect our parents and our grandparents. Uh, and among our elderly, also none of them would like to undermine the future of future generations. Uh, and this uh, nature, which provides us with so many ecosystem services, uh, must be perceived uh, as a common good that is so important uh, for our health. Uh, the services provided by nature uh, are ignored on a daily basis, uh, as was the case before the crisis of the services provided by doctors and nurses. Uh, but the well-being of young people of future generations really depends on our choices today and our ability to avoid or to confront affront new crises in the future. That will be dependent on the extent to which we protect biodiversity and take advantage of it. So once the crisis is over, we'll have to continue to ensure that there is full solidarity among the generations. I think that everyone is conscious of the fact that we are experiencing a very difficult period We'll probably have an economic crisis before us, uh, and we need to be able to work together to rise to this challenge. We can take advantage of these unfortunate circumstances uh, uh, to uh, start off with a better beginning and act in a way that does not uh, undermine the future of the planet. And young people are worried about their future, and they are perhaps the prime forces for change in this regard. The community of uh, young people associated in COMAB, in our association, uh, are hundreds of young people who work in biosphere reserves, uh, uh, who work with their local communities, and uh, through uh, various uh, fora, youth councils, and so on, we are asked uh, to provide our opinions, and we're always prepared to share our values and our good practices. And I believe that we are useful allies uh, to get us through this uh, trial. 
uh, and we're already committed to achieving the objectives of sustainable development and I think that UNESCO can count on us uh, to do everything possible to achieve the objectives of the 2030 Agenda. Thank you very much, Alisa, for your commitment in this uh, very uh, difficult period, which is a trial for all of us. Thank you for mentioning that crucial value of ecological solidarity. We'll no doubt come back to that. It's a very interesting concept. Maybe it needs to be made more explicit in operational terms. And, and I can perhaps uh, now turn to Eric uh, Julien uh, to ask him for uh, some thoughts in reaction to what was said by the representative of a major group, LVMH, uh, by a CNRS researcher and uh, by a young member of an NGO. And you're perhaps an interface, you're a bit of a bridge between uh, local knowledge and scientific knowledge. Uh, given your experience uh, with indigenous peoples in Colombia, you're the founder of an association called the Chendukua, and perhaps you could share with us your view of what has been said, um, your view of the crisis, what are the messages uh, to be learned from this, the lessons to be learned. Well, thank you very much, Emiriam. Thank you very much uh, to the three speakers. Thank you very much uh, to uh, what uh, Alice has said about local communities, what Rafael has said about, um, um, uh, about uh, the scientific aspect of things and what we've heard also from LVMA but perhaps uh, I can start uh, uh, with uh, what Anna Annan said. Uh, the values are like dead leaves. Uh, they fly away when the wind blows. And now the wind has blown. Uh, and we perhaps uh, forgot uh, that we have these values. Uh, and I think that this uh, re crisis really results in two ways of uh, reflecting. Uh, we need to think about this in, in a uh, society of mastery and control. We don't like uncertainty, that's stressful. We lose uh, our reference points, our baselines, and uh, but nature is uh, uh, uncertainty, and uh, so nature has come amongst us. Uh, uh, it is uh, disturbing our established order, our habits, our customs, our traditions. Uh, and one of the principles of life uh, is that uncertainty. A sudden change can occur uh, in uh, another thought, uh, another Another way of thinking about this is uh, that the Earth uh, is a living organism. And when you have these tremendous forest fires in Australia, for instance, uh, it is a disease. And that's a warning sign to us. Uh, it means that the planet is ill. Uh, I mean, the people I work with have been talked about underdeveloped, uh, primitive, uh, uh, autochthonous, indigenous. And, but for them, these two principles are not at all new. The blossoming of nature, the uncertainty of nature, the fact that uh, the planet is a living entity, those are not new or surprising things for these indigenous peoples, unlike us. Because in those societies, uh, the way they function is not the laws of men, but it's the principles of the living. What are the rules that uh, ensure a life, and what do you need to conform to in order to remain in harmony? Not to submit to, but to conform to. A very wise person uh, once said, uh, I uh, will take our significant uh, values and will hide them where human beings can never find, find them, because that's, uh, that's really the underpinning of their educational system, their governance system, their healthcare system, of course, and also their relationship with their land. Uh, but for us, it doesn't work that way at all. Uh, men as well, sometimes also women, uh, more recently, meeting in various assemblies and fora, get together and establish the laws of the Republic, that's applicable to all, and it's uh, men, not many women. I'll stress that once again. They decide on laws uh, for uh, men, and when it bothers them to have that particular law, they introduce a new law. So the principles of life uh, which facilitate life, uh, which ensure creativity, can you find that? Uh, is there a... Uh, uh, Lise Recu has said uh, that uh, man is in nature until he forgets where he is. So, uh, so men sometimes act almost against uh, life. So I think that uh, uh, 
and Marcel Proust uh, has stressed uh, the importance of being able to look at things uh, differently. And here we have a, diff a group, the uh, indigenous peoples I'm referring to, who have a different view. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying that they have a solution to offer. I'm just saying that we could be inspired by their understanding of the principles of life in order to decolonize our relationship with governance, with land use. What is a living governance? What is um, the uh, living a living enterprise by definition it's not dead and when you see burnout uh, in companies uh, it's not so far from reality sometimes they are almost uh, dead and when you're an indigenous person I mean how do you relate to the different kinds of organizations now in terms of the territory or of the land use uh, can we look at nature differently today we look at nature as a landscape that's aesthetic it's a raw material the indigenous peoples I work with, uh, I mean, there are uh, 457 uh, mining projects uh, in the land where they live, and that's going to be very deleterious for them. Uh, so, so, so looking at it as a raw material is terrible. Or is it a living matter with whom you need to act in alliance? If that's the case, then it's uh, no longer nature as an object, but nature as a subject, and that changes everything in epistemological terms. And that means that in such territories, in such areas, uh, you uh, need not to control or master anything, but rather to live with it and to relate uh, to it. Nature is a living organism with uh, certain functions. Uh, um, just like in a human body, you have the hair, you have the skin, you have the skeleton. I mean, in a territory, you have rivers, which are like a skeleton. You have trees. I mean, these are metaphors that I think can give you a sense of the importance of balance, of equilibrium. So I think that here I would agree with Alice. We need all together, both the elderly and the younger people, to work together. Together. Um, the territory is uh, very significant, and the invisible people, I mean, these Indians, the so-called Indians, 300 million people, uh, I mean, they don't really play a role in our modernity. One of them, whom I met recently in Colombia, told me that, uh, yes, I studied economics uh, for four years at university, uh, and I saw that in your uh, economic science, our way of perceiving economics uh, had no role to play. It was completely ignored. So I think that that's something that we need to keep in mind to have a different view. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Eric. And I think that uh, that will speak to Ellen, this uh, bridge between uh, an old way of looking at things and a new way of looking at things. We need perhaps to look at the crisis in a new way. At LVMH, what is your view of biodiversity? Are you going to change your perception as a result of the crisis? Uh, I mean, or will you take the opportunity to be a living enterprise in the sense of Eric? these principles of life. I mean, what are the opportunities that you see to be grasped? Well, what I've heard from the three other panelists uh, is very telling. Alice, uh, for instance, uh, uh, has uh, really spoken in a way that reflects uh, the values of our younger employees. Uh, I'm very much uh, in touch uh, with uh, young people in the company uh, with a manifesto for an ecological awakening. Uh, young people are really challenging us. Uh, they're interrogating us. They're uh, pushing us uh, uh, to do what Eric is talking about, namely to rethink the very foundation of our economic models. In a group like mine, that is a huge ambition. But it is a valid, a valuable uh, ambition. And this is not something that came to the fore with this crisis, which suspended a number of uh, ways of uh, approaching our economic models, which now need to be transformed. And there are a number of uh, subjects that we need to deal with now that we had to perhaps have started timidly to approach in the past. And one that is uh, not perhaps uh, all that sexy 
namely the issue of quantifying, of measuring, of, in, of accounting, of environmental accounting. That is a subject uh, on which we're going to be working a lot at uh, on at LVMH. The whole issue of environmental accounting worked uh, on a lot by Jacques Richard in particular, uh, and the idea being to include in your bookkeeping uh, an, an, an environmental debt in the same sense uh, that you have a financial debt. I mean, this is obviously very long-term work, it's complex, but I think it's crucial, I think it's key, because it uh, uh, forces us to think of accounting in a different way that is not purely economic or financial. And in addition to that, of course, there are a number of other transformations of the economic model that are necessary in order that it be more respectful of the environment and more inclusive in environmental terms. And something that we've been doing uh, even before the crisis will now intensify, namely we're discussing with the enologists of LVMH and of course Moet and NC, who are now working on the issue of living soil. We know, of course, that the soil is affected by many different things, in particular by the raw materials, by the um, uh, resources used to, to produce, and we need to be more sustainable. Um, and we are wondering what we can do in order that our practices evolve, that we make the soil once again a living entity, that we prepare the future, that we preserve certain products like champagne. I think that we'd all like to be able to drink a good champagne, but we need to have the grapes that can be used to produce it. In more prosaic terms, but that's also at the heart of our concerns, we need to look at everything that we can do to respond to the challenge of climate warming. And so that has a whole series of consequences, and this uh, crisis is showing us that we can uh, work remotely, reduce our traveling, perhaps uh, use uh, maritime freight to, to a greater extent than uh, aircraft. These are various solutions that are key, and we're working on uh, introducing them. And then the circular economy, I mean, this economic model that Eric has uh, mentioned, well, we, we have to tackle this uh, head on. Uh, we need to see how we can have a different economic model in the areas that we work in, uh, uh, producing uh, things from leather, uh, producing clothes. Uh, how can we uh, inspire ourselves much more from what is done in nature in order to produce uh, our products? Uh, we're working a lot on that. And of course, biodiversity. We have the good fortune to work in partnership with UNESCO on a program that I think is absolutely key because it's a very appropriate approach, and I'm referring to the MAB, the Man and Biosphere Program, of course, which has as a basis the relationship between man and the living environment that surrounds us. And here we're partners in a number of uh, programs being implemented by Guerlain, one of our companies, uh, in a number of biosphere reserves that have been identified. We're implementing projects to make sure that uh, grape production is done in a way that uh, is positive for the environment. Uh, for instance, uh, bees, which are so important for the whole biodiversity chain. So, so we're, we've been working on these issues already, and we're going to step up the effort. It's uh, crucial that these uh, real uh, model transformation approaches be implemented. It's a long-term approach. Uh, we know that we're in a transition period, but I think that if we base what we're doing on strong scientific research on the kinds of work that UNESCO is doing, 
then the way that we produce, uh, manufacture our products can, I think, be done in a more robust and sustainable way for nature. Thank you very much, Irene, for those very concrete examples relating to your economic model, uh, the connection with biodiversity, the thoughts that you have shared about the changes required in production modes, in consumption modes, that's reflected in the 2030 Agenda as well, the transformation, transformation also of economic models. We've seen in the analyses of many scientists that these models are need to be put into question. How can we transform these modes? A large group like yours can work on this, and uh, that's very stimulating that you're able to do things in certain respects. And now I'd like to ask uh, Raphael about this uh, ecological transformation or transition which requires a change in the economic model. Are there, as you see it, uh, some major obstacles on which we need to concentrate over the next months or weeks or years to come in order to resolve them? Yes, indeed. There is a very great number of obstacles that have been identified. Uh, and um, Eric has already talked about a holistic change in approach that we need better to measure the change, to have tools in place that would ensure traceability, transparency about the territorial origin of products and what uh, their production has by way of a socioeconomic impact. Now, if I look at this from a purely sort of Western point of view, uh, and if I try to set aside the issue of our individual desires, routines, and so on, the obstacles uh, uh, confronting economic transition are quite, uh, are quite numerous. I could think of uh, six or seven right away, a point raised by Hélène, the need to have the intellectual, technical, and financial means that would be dedicated to the transition, we're seeing all sorts of signals from the uh, economic and financial world that are showing us that we're not really moving in that direction. Another obstacle, uh, which is more cultural in nature, because uh, people don't like to be restricted or limited. Uh, over the last few years, it's become very uh, fashionable uh, to uh, consume uh, coffee uh, in these uh, single doses, even though we know that this uh, raises all sorts of waste and recycling problems. Another obstacle is perhaps more ideological in nature. This uh, could have to do uh, simply with uh, public opinion. Many citizens, uh, despite the COVID-19 crisis, still think uh, that uh, ecology uh, is uh, a concern of uh, uh, sort of the hippie type uh, population, uh, and it doesn't concern them. Then there's the economic obstacle, the fact that we have these uh, socioeconomic uh, systems that we have have a capitalist uh, uh, nature extractive kind of model. And uh, when people talk about uh, transition, they're immediately asked uh, whether that will give jobs for everyone, because that's more important uh, than saving the planet, because we have so much inequality. A fifth obstacle is perhaps more institutional in nature because we know that the rules and laws evolve quite slowly, but the public health crisis that we've experienced or are still experiencing, at least in France, is showing us that sometimes the political will can in fact change. Things that may have seemed irreversible turn out to be changeable. Another obstacle would be of uh, more of a moral nature. The uh, need to change is not something that's all shared. Most of us would like to have things change, but we don't want to do this just on our own. We want it to be uh, sort of an, a, a joint effort. 
but everyone is sort of waiting for the others and they don't change so one doesn't change yet another obstacle which is crucial which is important that is the obstacle of decision making power at different levels of one's organization local regional national international here it's a question of economic financial powers that don't really uh, cooperate or not much uh, i mean this uh, short list uh, is quite daunting but despite all of that i think that one can be optimistic because all around the world we are observing that there's a great number of projects being implemented and we see that if there is an individual will that can that is transformed into collective action then companies come on board political decision makers come on board and that can uh, inspire a collective interest in a project that might start on a small scale and uh, but that can then be extended to a larger scale so at the level of a local community when a group of the population uh, does this sort of thing that uh, can generate knowledge about socioeconomic interdependencies it can uh, strengthen uh, solidarity links uh, it can strengthen resilience to crises and therefore be a good example for others thank you thank you very much uh, rafael uh, for that uh, list of obstacles uh, uh, but ending up nevertheless uh, with something more optimistic uh, as we heard earlier turning now to alice uh, given your vision of your generation these uh, opportunities mentioned by elaine and the obstacles uh, mentioned by rafael what really is your perception of the transition of the transformation required i mean are you optimistic or pessimistic is there an opportunity or is there just a bunch of obstacles well i remain optimistic i i don't think we have a choice we have to continue to be optimistic to continue to work to change the world even if it's step by step even if it doesn't all happen as quickly as we would like now young people are perhaps too optimistic maybe we're dreamers maybe we're too utopian but we need that in order to push for more change and for faster change i think that we can also take advantage of the experience and the knowledge of uh, our elders in order not to recommit the errors of the past uh, to make sure that we become more resilient in particular for the older persons amongst us so there are some positive aspects um, we're putting into question the way we live the way our societies are organized there are a lot of questions about our world of tomorrow what changes do we want for tomorrow's society how are we going to rebound now in comab we've already managed uh, uh, imagined how societies uh, can be more resilient by closer links with the biosphere uh, a resilient and sustainable way of living in harmony with nature is uh, possible pioneers have shown that this is possible even before the crisis i'm thinking in particular of some farmers uh, who uh, were involved in direct sales uh, now some of them uh, more of them are selling directly to the consumers uh, shortening the supply chain sometimes they can't even meet the demand and i hope that this is something that will extend and will be replicated and disseminated and and i do believe that these uh, initial changes uh, are harbors uh, harbingers of uh, uh, some future major change thank you very much so your optimism based in concrete uh, field experience and uh, links uh, with uh, older people um, uh, and I, I, I think that we can nerd turn to Eric, uh, given what previous speakers have said about opportunities, about obstacles, uh, about uh, values coming to the fore, like solidarity, uh, harmony with uh, one's territory. How do you see uh, the bridge um, among different worlds, different visions, perhaps? Uh, um, and what seems to you to be essential to rebuild something better for the future. 
Well, thank you very much. I think that there's been a lot of wealth and diversity of ideas. A number of thoughts I might want to share with you at this point. First of all, I believe a lot in dialogue, in genuine dialogue. Meeting others where I um, accept uh, being forced to answer difficult questions. In history, we've seen that when people engage in genuine dialogue, uh, I mean, we've seen this uh, in Andalusia, where there were discussions uh, with uh, among the Orthodox, uh, the Catholics, uh, and the Muslims. Uh, it was a tremendous period of peace, tranquility, and prosperity in our areas, including the cultural. So when you have genuine dialogue among the old and the young, uh, the men and the women, I mean, we don't have the same view of things sometimes, uh, and foreigners, people coming in from outside, that is uh, tremendously creative. Uh, the indigenous people say often say that your problem is your dream. You need to change your dream. And in this kind of dialogue, you can, in some sense, uh, materialize dreams. I mean, you do this in schools. You tell children, uh, really uh, think of how there can be a, a, a real prosperous uh, future of a different color, if you will. Uh, I mean, we're often afraid of not knowing where we're going. We want to remain in our old habits, our old traditions. We don't want to get out of that. We don't want to get out of our boxes. But I think that uh, you can really open up such dialogue, and I uh, tried uh, to do this. I think it was a, a sort of a, a first attempt. We invited four Kogi shamans, uh, I mean, they're uh, polyscientists. We invited them to come to the Drome in France, and they said, uh, you have a week uh, to uh, evaluate, to do a diagnosis, of the uh, health uh, situation in the Drôme. I mean, these are people who had never left their own mountains. And here they were for a week in the Drôme. And the idea was, I mean, do they have a, a vision? Will they have a vision that uh, we completely don't uh, uh, envisage? I mean, uh, what they can perceive, would that work uh, in our area? Uh, and then we uh, brought in also some 30 scientists uh, who simply had uh, the uh, virtue of uh, being prepared to be questioned about their view of the world. Uh, so the Kogi went up into the mountains uh, and uh, the uh, scientists uh, went to the regional archives uh, in order to look at the maps and so on. And then they all got together. There were historians, sociologists, uh, biologists, geographers, and so on. And there was a time of exchange amongst them. And uh, on both sides, uh, there was astonishment. And I think that that's something that we need. We need to be surprised. Uh, I mean, uh, you need to open up uh, uh, the scope of what is uh, possible. Uh, and the four, four registers that came out of this were fascinating. There was the common sense. Uh, uh, I mean, there are 80% of us and 90% of us who live in cities. There's, uh, uh, we don't understand nature at all. Uh, I mean, there's an Englishman who wrote a book called Nature Kills. Uh, I don't want to list all of the examples. Uh, uh, but um, I, I wouldn't say that it was uh, pathetic, but but the ideas were, were so fundamental. I mean, it really gave you a sense of how much we don't understand nature. And, and the Kogi simply uh, showed uh, some examples. Uh, and the uh, second uh, register was that of knowledge. Uh, the Kogi immediately identified that in the home there was a lot of uh, pine forest uh, deforestation. Uh, uh, I mean, it's an area with a lot of acidification. Uh, animals uh, can't uh, migrate much anymore. That can be very uh, deleterious. Various, uh, I mean, the naturalists with us uh, knew that there was a, a problem of um, uh, water retention, and the scientists uh, validated that uh, the, Shoki, the Kogi were right. Yes, uh, they had access uh, to knowledge that was debatable. But how did you know that? How did you know that was the question. And that was uh, disturbing uh, for them. And then the third uh, level at which uh, there was a discussion uh, had to do 
uh, with uh, the uh, territory. I mean, uh, there really is a different way of acceding to knowledge. One can perhaps objectivize. I mean, uh, you can look uh, uh, on uh, your geolocation uh, uh, screen and uh, find uh, exactly where you are. That was inconceivable for them. Now, but I'm convinced uh, that there can be a genuine exchange. But there was a fourth uh, level at which uh, they were interacting, and that perhaps uh, was what I liked uh, the most, uh, namely the way of working together. When young people, company businessmen, uh, entrepreneurs, politicians, uh, scientists uh, all uh, understand that uh, with our diverse approaches and our diverse knowledge, uh, we can really exchange uh, and go together, then uh, uh, and, uh, that is uh, really uh, something that uh, can germinate. And uh, a, a tremendous uh, obstacle that we have is our incapacity to get out of our ego echo systems. Uh, I mean, the um, the PFH, the so-called human factor. Uh, can we really go in the direction of echo systems where everyone with his own tradition, uh, his own color, and so on, can turn it all into a kaleidoscope? And that's something that really um, uh, can gives me a lot of uh, enthusiasm and passion, the ability to uh, engage in dialogue with others. Uh, Dudamel in Venezuela, a, uh, an orchestra conductor. Uh, now he stopped doing this, uh, but at one point he uh, created a movement called the system, and the idea being that young people in cities uh, could get out of poverty and violence uh, through classical uh, music. Uh, so you have this. Uh, uh, orchestra conductor who's now in Los Angeles, but at the time he was the conductor of the National Orchestra. And I asked, he was asked, uh, what is the role of the conductor? Uh, and I mean, he just uh, smiled. He just smiled. Uh, I mean, you almost wanted to give him a hug. Uh, I mean, there was obviously this uh, interior thinking. And he said, the role of the conductor is to open up a space of uh, freedom in everyone that be able to contribute uh, to the common invention of the dream of tomorrow. And that's what we need. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for those examples, for that music at the end, which resonates so strongly in my ears of a UNESCO employee. Uh, dialogue, uh, cross-fertilization of cultures, uh, that's a bit our role, our mandate as an international organization. So thank you for reminding us of something essential. We need that space uh, for dialogue, and that's something that we tried to do with today's uh, panel, uh, to cross-fertilize uh, different approaches, uh, uh, different visions uh, from different points of view. But let me now uh, give the floor back maybe uh, to Alice uh, to begin with for a few words of conclusion. I mean, uh, obviously, the conversation will continue beyond this uh, celebration of the living on World Biodiversity Day. Alice, I'd like you to tell us uh, by way of conclusion, do you have uh, a last uh, message about what connects us, about what links us uh, together, what really is the glue that keeps all human beings uh, together. Well, I think that this crisis uh, has reminded all of us, uh, wherever we live in the world, that we're all linked in together and we're linked to nature. I mean, the virus is part of our ecosystem, unfortunately, but that's the way it is. And this public health crisis, uh, at least looking at it uh, from the West, uh, it started out, ah, it's a Chinese problem, it's not going to affect us. Uh, but then it became a pandemic, it became a worldwide problem. And sometimes we might also have the impression that uh, the climate change crisis, the pandemic, is not something that affects us, it only affects other countries, but we're beginning to understand that's not the, not the case. Uh, 
So in nature, interconnects all of us. And there are some positive aspects to globalization. We are 7 billion human beings who can all contribute to finding a solution. Scientists, I think, all around the world are, are trying together, I would imagine, to do what they can to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, so, so we can all engage in good practices, uh, replicate them elsewhere in order to tackle this problem, which has become a global problem. Thank you very much, Alice. And maybe you, Rafael, now a few words of, uh, of conclusion. Well, I must say that I appreciate it very much. Uh, everything that was said in the course of this panel. So what interconnects us? What binds us uh, together uh, through this crisis? Uh, well, like Alice, uh, I would be tempted to say that uh, thanks to the crisis, uh, perhaps uh, a great majority of us have understood that we are interdependent, that there is a circularity to what happens in the short, medium, and long term, and what also perhaps links us, interconnects us in this crisis, is the growing awareness of the fact that the future resilience of our societies also uh, depends on our relationship with uh, nature. Uh, and we really uh, cannot uh, allow economic issues uh, to predominate over ecological issues. And what can also interconnect us, what can unite us uh, through this crisis, is simply uh, the, um, the more renewed or growing awareness of uh, the fact that we have to take the right, make the right choices in order to give meaning back to the environment within which we live the harmonious relationship between us uh, and that uh, surrounding environment. Uh, respect for nature, uh, quite simply, in order better to respect one another and to respect ourselves, and especially to respect others. Now, perhaps uh, we could uh, uh, close uh, with some recommendations. I think that what's at stake is to make sure that everyone becomes individually responsible and jointly responsible through solidarity, through interconnection and joint action with uh, other groups, with communities, uh, to be in solidarity with the rest of the living environment, uh, the non-human living environment as well. And I think that everyone can make uh, a contribution at her or his own uh, level. I mean, COMAB in France, uh, Biosphere Reserves uh, elsewhere, internationally, locally. Everyone can make a contribution at her or his scale to begin with, and then at other levels if possible. And I think it's urgent to define through co-construction, through dialogue, through the sharing of knowledge and viewpoints, we really need to put on the table what we all want. And when we engage in some negotiations about conflict of use, for instance, at a local level, yes, uh, be open to others uh, and have this um, uh, field of possibilities uh, completely open and then uh, try to increase uh, our capacity of uh, adaptation. And I think that that's uh, really what's at stake uh, in this transformation, this necessary transformation of our societies uh, in response uh, to the planetary upheaval that we're confronted with. We talk about COVID-19 uh, at the present time, but Alain has mentioned that the overall biodiversity crisis and climate warming are also with us. Uh, uh, and after all, we're here to celebrate Biodiversity Day. So, so let's uh, not forget that. That's something that needs to be uh, dealt with, uh, with lucidity, with determination, uh, and with openness to all of the possible choices. Thank you very much, Raphael, uh, Hélène, by way of conclusion opening up the field of possibilities. 
Well, a lot of things uh, were said in the course of this panel, which I fully agree with, and in particular, the need to be in full respect of the interactions between man and nature. But I would like uh, perhaps uh, to conclude more particularly uh, with uh, this uh, dream of uh, being fully committed to dialogue, as Eric has uh, suggested. The, it's it's uh, very important that we get out of our silos, uh, that we get out of our partitions, uh, of our boxes. Uh, to break that down and to really interact with others is absolutely fundamental if we want to reconstruct our socioeconomic models. Uh, uh, and I note that in the crisis, uh, there has been a lot of solidarity among agents who formerly did not communicate, did not exchange with one another. The, between the public and the private sectors, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, challenges of the crisis uh, were met by a, a joint effort of uh, agents in the public sector, the private sector, at the local level, at the higher level, scientists. Uh, I never learned as much uh, as I did over the last few weeks by listening to scientists uh, uh, and uh, by taking advantage of what they could teach us. Uh, we need to take advantage of people who have, uh, who have that knowledge. And I think that there's an alchemy uh, that's growing among people with completely different backgrounds, completely different experiences experiences, and I think that thanks to that, we can make progress. But we need to have the courage, we need to have the determination, and I hope that that value of courage required to break down the partitions, to break down the silos, uh, has to be with us. Uh, the courage is required, and I think that uh, if there are enough of us uh, from enough different uh, networks and backgrounds with the courage uh, to really listen to one another and uh, to share with others uh, uh, that, uh, that we can succeed. And these values, uh, of course, are in the DNA of UNESCO. And so working with UNESCO, I think we can achieve a lot of this. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been a very enriching panel. We've had a wonderful exchange, a wonderful dialogue. UNESCO commits itself to continuing these discussions in very uncertain times. No one can predict what is going to happen. But in any event, to have these spaces of dialogue, of sharing, of co-construction, of co-creation, can be extremely creative and inventive. We are capable of uh, coming together on the basis of shared common values. And as you have all said very eloquently, we are capable of changing things. We are capable of being creative, of making uh, possible what might have seemed impossible. Human creativity is absolutely extraordinary and uh, magic, uh, magical. We uh, must, uh, as neighbors, as citizens, as uh, members of a family, members of a professional association or of a large uh, private sector company, uh, wherever we are, our roles uh, are always important. Uh, we need uh, uh, to cross-fertilize our knowledge, transform our common thoughts, uh, shared thoughts uh, into action. It is now that we must act. And this time of crisis also teaches us that there is just the present. We weren't able to predict what would happen, so we need to think of the present. You've talked about courage. The courage is in the heart. We need to look into our hearts. Um, this is something that we've heard from Eric at, uh, as well. We need to look into ourselves in order jointly to build, to build together a new world, a different world with more solidarity, with more harmony between us and other living species and amongst ourselves. Uh, humanity uh, perhaps will really have a future once we reach the understanding that we are just one species living in interaction with other living species. So thank you very much. We will remain in touch. We'll continue this dialogue about what is impossible to make it possible. Thank you.